first of all, to Istanbul, especially if this is your first chance to visit Istanbul. Um, welcome to the uh, first International Agenda for Excellence in Research Conference. Uh, as I said, welcome to Istanbul. Welcome to Kadir Haas University. Uh, my name is Mary Lou O'Neill, if you don't already know me. <laughs> I, uh, I wear a few different hats. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, Gender and Women's Studies Research Center here at the university. I also have an academic appointment in the political science department. Um, for our purposes here today, <laughs> I'm the coordinator of the Gender uh, for Excellence in Research Project, uh, which of course is the reason why we're here. Uh, so um, we're here, it's a Saturday. Um, today, not only are we here in the historic city of Istanbul on the shores of the Golden Horn, but we are currently sitting in the former Jibaldi Tobacco Factory, which was founded in 1884. So this sort of sandstone colored building that we're in and the block next to us are part of the original tobacco factory. Uh, okay, um, the, on the far end of the, they're all connected. On the far end of the building, there's sort of a, a more modern glass structure, which was added uh, later uh, after the university moved here. Okay, so uh, founded in 1884 uh, under the Ottoman Empire, continued in operation until 1995. Uh, so a quite long history uh, here in this building. At its height, the factory boasted a workforce of more than 2,000, of which 70% were women. Uh, the factory was essentially a small town. Uh, it included its own police and fire departments, uh, health facilities, school, and a child care center, which at one time cared for nearly 700 children. Uh, we did a project at one point where we interviewed former uh, workers in the, uh, who had worked, women workers who had worked here in the fact factory. One of the things that they most often recalled was there was a whistle. Many of them lived in and around the university, what is now the university in this neighborhood behind us. And there was a whistle that marked the, that they had, you know, 10 minutes or so left until work started. So the whistle would sound and they would run from their house to not be late. But that was one of the really enduring uh, memories. Um, one of the only things we don't have, I mean, I'm happy to say we don't have a whistle anymore. I'm not sure we need that either for the start of work or for the start of, uh, of classes. Although you, if you are walking around, although it's a weekend, if you were here during the week, you, you will hear, you know, kind of electronic bell sounds, which are school bells. We have electronic bells for the uh, K through 12 schools. So that's not an unusual sound to, to hear around you. Um, the place uh, where we currently sit is steeped in a gendered history. I like to think that the ghosts of the thousands of women workers who inhabited this space are still here with us, maybe even guiding us, helping us along. And if you take the opportunity, please feel free to wander around inside the university. Um, you'll see that um, if you go this way uh, into uh, the sort of atrium outside of the art faculty, there is an exhibition about the tobacco uh, monopoly that was held by the state and shows, it gives a little history of the, of the tobacco history. But all through many of the halls, you'll see old pictures uh, of the factory. Um, and, and again, I think it's been very sympathetically restored so you can see the bones for those of you who are architecturally inclined. I know there's a few of you, a few of you uh, out there. Kadir House University was founded in 1997. <laughs> We're babies in university terms. <laughs> Um, we took up residence here in 2002. Uh, since its founding, the university has built a strong commitment to equality in general and to gender equality in specific. The university was one of the first in Turkey to enact a policy against discrimination and harassment, followed by the creation of a prevention unit for gender-based harassment, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. Uh, in 2019, the university created its first gender equality plan, which has since been updated and approved by the university senate and executive board. Um, in addition to the institutional commitment to gender equality, KHAS has also long been home to research in gender and 
in gender and research that integrates a sex and or gender perspective. This includes a PhD program in gender studies, which began accepting students in 2020, uh, so fairly new. Uh, uh, we also retain a strong core of faculty, some of who are dotted among you, I see you out there, um, who, are, who, conduct, who regularly conduct gender-related research, um, and a number of them have received both national and international funding for projects on topics ranging from an oral history of women workers at the uh, tobacco factory uh, to issues related to gender security and justice, the experience of LGBTI plus individuals in employment, uh, and gender and micro credit programs, just to name a few. Continuing the tradition of strong working women in this building, three women faculty members currently serve as coordinators of EU funded projects. That was a really big success for us in the last uh, few years. Of course, one of those projects is Gender X, Gender for Excellence in Research, which of course is the reason why we are here today. With a little luck, I'll talk a little bit about Gender X. <laughs> uh, with a little luck from technology. Looks good so far. Uh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. No updates, no signing into anything. I don't know, you're <laughs> making me nervous. <laughs> I don't tell, I mean, yeah, that made me nervous. Um, uh, just, a, uh, just a brief overview of the project, just so that you have some idea of, of what's behind all of this. Um, GenderX is a three-year project of which we are a little bit more than halfway through. Um, we're in month 18, if I can count the months correctly. Um, its basic aim is to stimulate the integration of sex and gender into all research content. So it doesn't matter what the content of the research is itself. We argue that it needs to have a sex and or a gender perspective in order to be complete research, okay? Um, this is essentially a what we call a twinning project. So it has two aims. One is the sort of more academic aim of integrating sex and gender uh, into research content and teaching people how to do that. And the other aim, of course, is to help the Gender and Women's Studies Research Center at uh, Kadir Haas University become better at what we do. And one of the ways we are doing that is we are partnering with three universities who are represented here today. So we have TU Dublin, raise your hands, TU Dublin. We have uh, the University of Genoa, yay! And we have Lund University, yay! So we have three international partners who are in a way helping um, us to build capacity, get better at what we do, build our reputation, so on and so forth. Um, you can see our, you know, more specific objectives. We're trying to raise awareness. We're trying to increase capacity. We're working on networking. So please use this as an opportunity to network. <laughs> okay. And of course, we're trying to improve the skills that we have as a center in and of itself. Okay. Um, this is a lovely four-step model. Essentially, uh, as part of the project, we recognize that a lot of people understand the importance of integrating a sex and gender perspective, but they don't necessarily know how to do it. So that's where our project comes in. We are trying to give people the skills and knowledge they need to add sex and gender to their own research, whatever that research is. So we're offering some trainings, we're offering some exchanges between our partner countries, and of course, the hope is that this builds a pool of people who are integrating sex and gender, hopefully future publications, future projects, so on and so forth. It's a little bit of a complicated model. This is perhaps of more interest to you, future opportunities under the Gender X project, okay? One of them, in September, we will host Gender School here at Kaveh Haas University five-day intensive school in how to integrate a sex and gender perspective. And this year in particular, we're trying to also focus on research funding, okay, which we all know is a 
part of our academic lives now. Um, it's going to be held here. We have room for 32 participants. Uh, we're taking applications now. If you're interested, check out the GenderX website or talk to one of us. That would also be great. Um, in 2023, we will launch an online training that is about engendering research in all disciplines created by our lovely friends at TU Dublin are heading up that part of the project, okay? One year from now, there will be the second International Gender and Research Conference. So if you have more work that you're working on, we would love to see you again next year as well, okay? Um, out of this conference, we plan to publish your, we would like to publish your papers. Let's put it that way. This is being led by our friends here at Lund University. Uh, we will, after the conference, we will put a call out for full papers if you are interested. This will be a peer-reviewed process for an electronic, uh, you know, peer-reviewed uh, proceedings from the conference. Uh, we plan one for this conference and another one for the next conference next year. So good opportunity out there to possibly publish. Thank you. So keep in touch with us at GenderX. There's our web address. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever your pleasure is. They're posting a lot today. If you have questions, concerns, difficulties, um, any of our uh, students in green t-shirts can help you with uh, you know, where things are here at the university in particular. Um, Salma, many of you know from the project, uh, will be helpful. Uh, and right on time, Chara came back in the door. Chara can also help as well. Uh, um, and um, Denis Altuntash uh, also can help, although Denis's job right now is to be a speaker on our first panel. Um, so yes, so now um, my other job here today, of course, is to introduce our keynote speaker. Very exciting for me. Um, uh, I'm actually quite excited for this keynote. Um, uh, our keynote speaker today is uh, Yvonne Galligan, uh, our partner from uh, TU Dublin. She is also in her other job, as I like to say, uh, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, and she is also a professor of comparative politics in the Technological University in Dublin. She was founding director of the Center for Advancement of Women in Politics in Queens University, Belfast, and is now founding director of RINCE. Do we say RINCE? RINCE, sorry. Okay, I was like, RINCE can't be right. RINCE, which is a center of excellence in innovation, research, and practice on equality, diversity, and inclusion. She is a past vice president of the International Political Association and past president of the Political Studies Association of Ireland. She is serving a second uh, term as honorary treasurer of the Political Studies Association. Yvonne has served and chaired on so many important boards, a few, um, the Parliamentary Commission to consider the consequences of devolution on the House of Commons, the Women in Science Task and Finish Group, the Equality and Diversity Advisory Panel for the UK Research Assessment Frank, uh, Framework and the Markovitz Commission. Yvonne has led three successful institutional Athena Swan silver applications and has advised many institutions in Ireland, the UK and North America on their Athena Swan or similar applications. Uh, in a research vein, she has produced over a hundred publications on gender equality, including reports for governments, international organizations, and scholarly outputs. She is uh, impressive in her own right. We are proud to call her a partner on uh, our project. Uh, for our purposes here, I like to think of her as our partner on the GenderX project. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you very much, Mary Lou, for that uh, uh, a very generous introduction. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, colleagues and friends. Um, and I think it's a particular honor uh, to be invited to make this presentation today because it is the first 
International Gender for Excellence in Research Conference for Early Stage Researchers. So this is an historic moment. And this is a beautiful university. So it's wonderful that we are here. And it's also great to be in the historic city of, of Istanbul. Um, so thank you, Professor O'Neill, Mary Lou, and your team for welcoming us and giving us this opportunity to engage with one another in the context of the Gender X project. My subject today is gender and excellence in research. As a feminist researcher, I have long been interested in three things. One is, <coughs> is the position of women in academic research. The second is the manner in which feminist research is perceived by our peers and how that has changed over time. And the third is in the way that bringing a gender lens to bear, bear on a research question opens up new knowledge. <clears throat> These academic interests have brought me on a journey of critical analysis and reflection together with wonderful collaborators, among them Dr. Sarah Clavero, Professor O'Neill, as I have said, and many other women and men who were and are unafraid to ask curiosity-driven questions on gender and research. And it is good to note that attitudes have changed over time. When I began my PhD in political science in 1989, a male in my class asked me what my research subject was about. I replied that it was about exploring the influence of women's groups on public policy related to women's rights in Ireland. His reply was, that will be a short thesis. I was taken aback, but undeterred. <laughs> Today, anyone daring to make such a remark would be criticized at least. In my case, I'm very happy to say that the sex and gender question in my research continues to yield interesting projects, collaborations, and publication opportunities, as in this GenderX project. As time has progressed, I have seen the gender question become more central to the endeavors of higher education. Gender equality is today widely accepted as a mark of excellence in terms of institutional reputation and quality of teaching, research, and innovation. It is now becoming a key performance indicator, a measure by which universities are assessed. And if, if there is one thing that high achieving organizations such as universities want is to be recognized as the best in class. One indication of the relevance of gender equality to the academy is its inclusion in the Times Higher Education University Impact Rankings. These are the global performance tables that assess universities against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Introduced in 2019, the table on sustain Sustainable Development Goal 5, Gender Equality, measures universities' performance in three areas. First, their research on the study of gender. Second, their policies on gender equality. And third, their commitment to recruiting and promoting women. In 2022, from the 938 institutions assessed on this indicator, the top spot went to Chiang Mai University in Thailand. And only one Western university gain, gained a top five placing. That was the University of Western Australia. I think that gives us food for thought. This global attention to gender equality has not come out of the blue. For the past two decades, 
progressive women and men in academia have promoted the adoption of gender equality as an essential institutional condition for teaching and research excellence. Their work has transformed universities' policies, procedures, and practices. Today, the stereotypical academic, which was a man of any age, unburdened by caring responsibilities, and free to devote his life to intellectual pursuits, is becoming an anachronism in the modern university. Today, the typical academic is much more diverse in terms of gender and other characteristics. Universities today either have or are under pressure to have policies on gender balance in decision making. They are required to take gender into account in recruitment and promotion practices. And they are also under pressure to support gender based research and research that includes a gender perspective. Thus, Kader Haas, for example, has a gender equality plan to address these issues, as we do in TU Dublin, and I guess Lund had one, maybe still has one too, um, and Genoa as well. All of us partners with Kader Haas in this project. Funding bodies too are increasingly looking for gender equality plans from universities. European Union funding is a case in point. In her preface, and I'm just going to switch now to my slides. So in her preface um, to the 2021 publication of She Figures, charting the progress of women in academia and research, European Commissioner Maria Gabriel said, the COVID crisis has, has aggravated the social and economic challenges that the European Union is facing and has disproportionately, disproportionately affected women, including in research and innovation. However, she says, we have an opportunity to shape the recovery, to make it greener, fit for a digital world and more inclusive. Women's full participation in research and innovation is thus crucial for Europe's recovery. There is no sustainable recovery if it is not gender sensitive. That's a clear message to the research community that women and the gender dimension must be an integral part of research and innovation. To aid us in that task, the European Commission has identified 130 subfields where data showed that a gender analysis can benefit research, not just one, two or three subfields, 130. These range from computer hardware and architecture to nanotechnology, oceanography, geosciences, organic chemistry, aeronautics, space medicine, biodiversity, ecology, biophysics, among others. The League of European Research Universities has been to the fore in publishing position papers on gender equality in higher education and research. And in 2022, made available online their member institutions' gender equality plans as a resource. And that's there for any of us to look at, and all of us to look at indeed. Our partner and colleague, Professor Thomas Braga, has been heavily involved in these successive Leru activities. But why should we pay attention to the aspect of sex and gender in our work? Because when we do this work, we're often asked by others, why do we do it? The Norwegian Feminist Research Centre, Kilden, provides us with an answer. In their excellent book, what is the gender dimension in research? Kilden say, and I quote, uh, integrating the gender dimension in research is an added value in terms of excellence. It helps researchers question gender norms and stereotypes and to rethink standards and reference models. It leads to an in-depth understanding of the needs, behaviours and attitudes of both genders. It also enhances the societal relevance 
of the knowledge, technologies, and innovations produced. The booklet then goes on to present case studies from research fields such as health and well being, food, agriculture, and fisheries, energy, transport, environment, and climate and safe societies. Another project <clears throat> titled Integrating a Gender Analysis into Research also gives us helpful justifications as follows. And they say, introducing a gender sensitive approach makes research and teaching of higher quality and validity by helping in making research results more relevant for society, enabling development of new research, teaching and career progress paradigms in research institutions, and enabling researchers to write more competitive proposals. And both of those uh, references are very helpful for us to absorb and to use as our response when we are, uh, are asked, why do we study gender in our research? But knowing why we should integrate the gender dimension in research is one step. Knowing how we can do it is the next step. The European Union has funded multiple projects supporting the integration of gender equality in universities and research organizations, and it promotes the inclusion of the gender dimension in research. These projects can provide us with tools to address these issues as we all strive to deliver excellent research. Gendered Innovations, for example, provides us with detailed worked examples from all fields on how gender can be integrated into scientific research. We need the help that these projects can give us because research has a long way to go to incorporate gender. For example, in a paper examining what needs to be done, the League of European Research Universities pointed out that in medical research, 44% of publications on diseases prevalent in women did not report the sex of the subjects or the, or the specimens studied. Similar results are known from basic neuroscience and endocrinology. The result of this pervasive bias, both in preclinical and clinical science, is that medicine and healthcare, as they are practiced today, are less evidence-based for women than for men. Eight out of 10 drugs that were withdrawn from the market in the US between 1997 and 2000, that's only a three year period, were found to have worse side effects in women than in men. Or as the Gendered Innovations um, uh, Project points out, <coughs> Many examples exist of stereotyping in design and engineering aimed at girls and women. For example, manufacturers often, often assume that shrinking and pinking a design makes it more fit for or attractive to girls and women. However, research shows that pink and round shapes in toys don't always appeal to young girls or that adding fashion to video games does not necessarily make them more attractive to girls and women. At the very least, products that are designed based on stereotypes instead of solid evidence are likely to reinforce or contribute to gender inequalities. If scientists do not recognize the different physiological makeup of women and men, for example, or if stereotypical beliefs exist about gender roles, innovations may be gender specific in ways that do not benefit all users. A recent Oxfam report, oh gosh, sorry, I don't have a slide for that. A recent Oxfam report puts the matter clearly. It says, gender blind research is just bad research. Not only does it risk undermining the reliability and validity of the findings 
and their representation and social realities. But it can also cause the programs, policies, and campaigns on which the research is based to reinforce rather than challenge patriarchal structures and gender inequalities. So, the case for including gender in research is pretty overwhelming. But for researchers who are not steeped in gender research already, it can be a struggle to tease out what gender in their context can mean and how one would go about operationalizing it. Professor Mary Hawksworth, political philosopher, provides us with a useful way of thinking about gender that can be applied to any research context. And she says that in a research context, gender is a heuristic device. In other words, it's a general concept aiding analysis that illuminates areas for inquiry, frames questions for investigation, identifies puzzles in need of exploration, and provides concepts, definitions, and hypotheses to guide research. In some cases, depending on the research, this might involve taking into account the sex of cells and tissues. In other cases, it could be identifying the relevant sex-related variables, for example, pain threshold differences between women and men, or how male and female skeletal structures respond differently to hip replacements. Or it could be in other instances, the research might call for thinking about gender norms, identities, and gender relations. And there are some fields where integrating a sex or gender dimension is not relevant, such as in mathematical theory, for example. But in this case, the integration of gender is not about the subject matter so much, it's about who is doing the research, who is getting the credit, are the collaboration opportunities equally available to the women and men on the research team? And is the team a gender balanced one across all stages of the career path? So one can't escape from gender in research, no matter what. There are of course, different ways of integrating gender in research, some of which embed gender more deeply in the project than others. Oxfam again has a very helpful set of terms and explanations that enables us identify the degree to which a gender dimension is present in our research. Although it's designed for research on development issues, it serves also as a guide to gender in STEM research and is as follows. So here you have it here. And I'm not going to go through each and every one, but here are the rubrics. So research can be gender blind. It can be gender aware. It can be gender sensitive. It can be gender responsive, or it can be gender transformative. This classification leads me to reflect on the integration of sex and gender in my own research. I have used female and male as a variable in opinion surveys or electoral studies. This was relevant in a number of research projects related to public support for gender equality, for examining the, the extent to which electoral rules held a gender bias, or for seeing if voters are more likely to support male over female candidates. The answer to the latter question was, not really. So, which of course brings forth many other questions. This work could be classified as being somewhere between being gender aware and being gender sensitive. In other research, I have used gender rather than sex as an organizing principle, an analytical framework and an interrogative practice. Such as when with my colleague, Dr. Clavero, we constructed a methodology for examining the gendered nature of democratic decision-making. 
it was highly revealing in its findings <clears throat> and showed us that this approach to examining the quality of democracy added fresh insights to standard studies and in fact exposed more democratic flaws than the usual methods employed for examining the nature of democratic politics. Although we completed this research about 10 years ago, it has stood the test of time as a solid example of how integrating a gender perspective can bring additional rigor with excellent results. So I would probably class this work as falling into the gender responsive category. Similarly, our work on a previous project with Professor O'Neill, Professor Braga, Dr. Ben Spinga and other partners on systemic action for gender equality in higher education, the SAGE project, that would fall into the same gender responsive category. This project was led by Professor Eileen Drew of Trinity College and yielded an important charter of principles for gender equality in higher education that is now promoted by the European Commission and central to its thinking when it is looking at uh, gender equality in higher education. What about gender transformative research? I can point to some examples of that too. Our current project called Resistire, led by um, the European Research Council and with many European partners, is looking at the gendered effects of COVID-19. This is one with a truly policy transformative potential as it seeks to influence public policy responses in the direction of more gender responsive solutions to the social consequences of COVID-19. A study that Sarah and I have published on analyzing gender equality in higher education rests on the concept of epistemic justice, a challenging one for higher education institutions to address and for current gender equality plans produced by these universities to integrate into their analysis. Again, it has transformative potential, not least by changing the way we interrogate gender equality in our universities and research organizations. So I'm going through these examples just to show you that I feel quite comfortable working to integrate gender in different ways, depending on the nature of the project. Not all the work one does can be at the transformative level and nor can it be transformative all of the time. The important point though, is that integrating a sex and gender component in research makes for more accurate observations of our world, whatever our discipline and research focus, and therefore better science. Integrating gender in research then can bring the researcher on an unexpected and exciting path. This is what Mario Chavez Claros from Colombia found when, as a newly qualified researcher, he undertook a study of public transport crime. Here are his words. The results of the research were somehow predictable, but one aspect of it was shocking. While most people said the experience of riding a bus was chaotic and insecure, something unexpected popped up. All female participants said they experienced some kind of sexual harassment. These results especially surprised me, he said. I guess as a man, I'm not usually aware of all the problems women have to face. So I expected common crimes such as robbery or thefts to appear in the results as the main issue to be resolved. The results may have surprised this young male researcher, but every woman in this room will recognize that experience and some men too. The example actually shows how important it is to begin to think about the gender aspect from the start of the project, rather than having it emerge as a significant finding in the course of or at the end of a research project. So it's critically important 
to consider the sex and gender aspects throughout the whole of the research cycle before ruling them out as non-significant. This includes considering their interactions with other identities. As Leru points out, gender analysis should be used when cultural attitudes, needs, and behaviors are important factors that may determine the study outcomes. Sex and gender can sometimes interact, most notably in biomedical research, which can demand complex analyses. Other factors may interact with sex or with gender or both, such as socioeconomic status, age or environment, and may diminish or amplify sex and or gender differences. Researchers need to consider and measure relevant factors and use them appropriately in the analysis. An article in Nature in 2019 discussed the potential for sex and gender analysis to foster scientific discovery, improve experimental efficiency, and enable social equality. Five scientists show how incorporating sex and gender could improve experiments, reduce bias, and create opportunities for discovery and innovation. The examples they use show that including sex and gender has led to advanced understanding in diverse fields, from male and female shellfish responding differently to climate change, to gendered social robots, and to artificial intelligence improvements prompted by evidence that facial recognition systems misclassify the sex of darker skinned women more often than lighter skinned men. In this article, they very helpfully offer us two decision trees to help us in considering the sex and gender dimension. And there's the first decision tree um, where if you are looking to analyze and to incorporate um, sex into your research in science and engineering in this case, but it could be in any, in any other field as well, that these are the questions that one would ask in terms of ruling in or ruling out the significance of uh, a sex dimension. And it gives uh, clear instructions on what to do at each stage. So I'm not going to read through it, you can see it there. And they do something similar for gender uh, here. So these are helpful questions to ask that enables one to step through the project um, fully integrating sex and gender into it. So in conclusion then, I hope that my reflections on the integration of sex and gender in research will encourage you to think about this in your own work. Questions on sex and gender will feed your curiosity and lead you to exploring interesting research avenues, whatever your discipline. Opening yourself to the gender dimension in research and innovation will lead you and your research teams to producing research that is more significantly sound, socially relevant, and life enhancing for everyone. So in my last words, I would say, embrace your curiosity and commitment to excellence in, re in research and make it work for a more gender equal world. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to listening to your presentations and learning from you on how you conceive of and integrate gender in your research. Thank you. <laughs>